Hello, everyone. Welcome to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. And uh, we have a very special episode today. Um, before we get into it, a quick disclaimer uh, from our sponsor. We just want to let you know that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch and with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of, any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. So audience members, again, that's you, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. That is the main takeaway. We're going to give you some great insight today and direction, but we don't know your specific case. So by all means, take that direction, bring it to your home team and make the best decision for you uh, moving forward. So I'm very happy to announce uh, that we are successfully, successfully this time hosting my friend, Dr. Mark Lewis, who tried to join us, I think back in December. Was that right, Dr. Lewis? Yeah. And we had a little, uh, it was not our fault. We found out it was, it was Facebook. We're going to, it was Facebook, a little technical, technical difficulties, but we rescheduled. He was gracious enough to give us his time again. And a quick announcement before I, I let him introduce himself. Uh, he has, uh, what, well, what do you have coming up at, at I have an urgent patient at 1045 my time. So I apologize. Yes. The conversation will be only about 45 minutes. In right. So <laughs> he has an urgent patient and everyone probably understands that that has to take precedence. We are grateful for all our experts time, but we always have to know that something could pull them away. And that is of the utmost importance, of course, and the top priority. But Dr. Lewis, very quickly, tell the folks what you do, uh, where you work and how you serve the net community. Yeah, you bet, Rain. So just a delight to talk to you and I'll say the neuroendocrine family. Um, and I have an interesting relationship. I have what I call a bicameral mind. So I think about it two ways. I am a doc, uh, but I'm also a patient. And those things are for me inextricably connected. So you asked about my location and my um, day job, so to speak. So um, you've been kind enough actually, Rain, yourself to come and visit me. So I work in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I work for an organization called Intermountain Healthcare. And um, especially for those folks that are maybe closer to the West Coast, maybe the best analogy I can make is we're kind of like Kaiser Permanente in the sense that we're a large integrated healthcare system that does a lot more than just oncology or endocrinology. Uh, but we serve a very wide geographic expanse. Now, California very famously is you know, populous and dense in most places. We actually kind of have the opposite where we're covering a really vast geography. As it happens, Intermountain requires me to be licensed in six states. So uh, Utah, obviously, but essentially all the uh, surrounding states. The Rockies are kind of a, a firewall. We don't have much of a presence in Colorado, but everything else sort of from the Rockies west to the Pacific Northwest is our territory. And especially in the era of COVID, I've increasingly been doing what we're doing right now and connecting to patients in other states, sometimes hundreds of miles away, and either consulting with them and sometimes even directing their treatment. So one of the things that we've learned is there's a lot you can do through the computer and there's a lot you can do to bring care closer to home. And we can maybe even get into some of those logistics later. Uh, I am a medical oncologist, so um, somewhat inexactly people describe me as a chemo doctor. Mm. Um, that's not wrong, but it's not all that I do. And right. one of the beautiful things about uh, neuroendocrine tumors, as your audience will be very well aware, um, is there are many options that actually aren't chemotherapy and many situations in which chemotherapy is inappropriate and, and giving it would be frankly malpractice. So um, I'm the director of gastrointestinal oncology here. It's a very brief professional origin story. I did my training in oncology at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. My wife is a native Texan. So after not three years, but three winters there, as she put it, she said, uh, this is a little cold. Uh, those were not her exact words, but that was the gist. And we moved back to Texas for my first job after fellowship, which was at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And Anderson is, is pretty famously, a, a, it's a world-renowned center. It is phenomenal at research. Um, but I've, I learned something there because I was one of only about a dozen oncologists in the whole place who were tasked with general oncology. So basically I had to be prepared to see almost literally anything that came through the door, which as you can imagine in a place like that really is a, a very, very vast spectrum. 
So on the one hand, I had to have breath. On the other hand, I was increasingly dealing with my own illness, which is neuroendocrine. And I had a dual appointment, uh, partly again out of my own um, selfishness, in gastrointestinal oncology. And I thought two things. Number one, I thought, wow, breadth and depth is a nearly impossible juggling act. And, and partly it's because we have a nice problem in oncology is, you know, there's so much progress and there's so much to know and it is constantly changing and evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's one, one part. And then the other part was, you know, I wanted to focus. I wanted to drill down on my tumor type. Um, and so I think that, um, I think that between those two things, um, I think it was uh, really sort of happenstance and, and providence that Intermountain, kind of out of the blue, back in 2016, said, hey, would you like to come work for us? You can do exclusively GI, and half your time can be clinical, and half your time can be focused on research. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, there's days like today where even when I try to carve out my time, you know, patient care is still sure. um, important sure. and, and takes precedence. Um, but overall, I've been absolutely over the moon here. Uh, and then the last thing I might say for your audience, and then more than happy to kind of open up for questions, we have a superb uh, support group uh, right here um, in town. So, you know, I've worked at Mayo, I've worked at MD Anderson. What's fascinating about those centers is that um, a lot of the patients that are coming there are traveling. You know, one phrase that you hear is, is medical tourists, and that's not meant to denigrate people that travel for care are far from it. But my point is, they tend to be somewhat migratory. They tend to come to the center, either get care there for a short period of time or just get a recommendation that they can go back and enact at home. And I think in carcinoid, that's extremely common actually. So what I'm getting at is, this is the first support group I've worked with where almost all the patients live right here. And so it gives you this really nice stable nucleus, even like a family feel to the support group. And my wife and I are, are members, you know, it's not just that I'm a medical advisor, it's right. I'm actually a participant and I get to benefit from that too. Um, so in all um, domains of my life, personal and professional, mm-hmm. uh, the move here has been wonderful. Awesome. I've had more time to devote to neuroendocrine tumor research and advocacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, my own care for what it's worth yeah. Yeah. has been really, really good. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, just thrilled to talk to your audience today. Awesome. I'm sure they're thr- thrilled to have you. And, and folks at home, I see our numbers are con- continuing to rise. That's great. This is about the time we get started normally. So hopefully the regulars are, are jumping in. I'm going to ask you to do two things. Today's a very unique episode. If you didn't catch that, if you signed on late, our guest today, Dr. Mark Lewis, is both uh, an oncologist in, in neuroendocrine tumors and is a patient. So really, this is going to be a, co- a very unique and comprehensive coming at it from both perspectives um, session that we have today. So I know that people would benefit from, from asking him questions. He has a very unique perspective. So if you know someone that would benefit from this comment that, you know, tag them in the comments, or you can share this video to their page to get as many people here as possible. And then secondly, and I always say this, if you see a question in the sidebar, uh, that you also have or you're interested in, you can like that question or love or any of the reactions that uh, Facebook gives you, but it upvotes it so I can see there's a demand for that question. I'll make sure that we get it across because again, we've got a short uh, short episode today. We're, we're stopping at a quarter till the hour. However, stay tuned for a special announcement because I have something for you at that moment when Dr. Lewis leaves. I'm not going to leave you like that. I got you folks. Um, so let us know. Go ahead and start sending your questions in. Like I said, we have a very unique uh, unique guest today. So uh, bef- go ahead and start sending your questions in. I want to start us off, Dr. Lewis, because yes. I have spent some time with you and found out a little bit about your story. And the idea, the question of the um, genetic component to this disease comes up every week on the show. Yes. So could you give the folks at home a little insight into your unique uh, journey in from that perspective yeah. uh, of how it how it has affected your family? Yeah, no, that's a phenomenal question, Ray. And, and again, I'm an open book. I long ago um, waived my own confidentiality, and I realized that not everybody has the privilege of doing that. And that's one Fair of the point. things we talk about in terms of the difference between a hereditary cancer and the phrase we use in oncology is sporadic. Hmm. Um, another sort of you know, colloquial translation there is just bad luck. So let me start by saying we have to be very careful, I think, with our um, definitions. So um, by necessity, every cancer is genetic, okay, meaning fair. that um, 
all cancers arise from mutations, so mm -hmm. mistakes in our code. The real question always is, is that mistake unique to the tumor or is it shared with, and, and therefore the tumor is caused by, a flaw, if you will, in, in the person? Mm -hmm. So in fact, even when we're doing our testing, most often in oncology, what we're testing is actually not the person. We're testing the tumor. And that's really important these days. So to date myself, when I was in high school, I wrote a paper on the Human Genome Project. And you know that was an endeavor that took years and years. It was international. It required, I think, billions of dollars and scientists all over the globe. And at the end of it, what it gave us was the sequence, the three billion letter long length of human DNA. You know, what is the normal sequence of those letters? It's only four letters, but then order they go in, man, does that matter? Right. Um, and then now, you know, barely two decades later, I can actually run that same trick, that same sequencing trick on my patient's tumor in about two weeks for about $1,200, which I realize is not jump change, but the speed at which we can do it is truly astonishing. I mean, in, in my lifetime, you know, you took me in high school and had me writing that essay and asked me, you know, am I ever going to be able to do this? A, am I going to be a doctor? And B, am I going to be able to do this stuff? I, I would have thought it was science fiction. Mm -hmm. So here we are. But my point is this. You can test someone's tumor and see what's making it tick. And then sometimes when you find out what those flaws are, and there may only be a few. One of the things that's kind of scary, actually, about oncology is sometimes when we do this sequence, and again, we're comparing to normal you may only find a couple letters difference. Um, and sometimes you find a flaw and you say, aha, I think this is more than just chance. I think this is more than just a photocopying error by the body. I think this is actually mm -hmm. something that's deep seated in that person. So in my case, in my genetic syndrome, my hereditary syndrome, mm -hmm. a single letters difference in the three, three billion letters long that make me, me and you, you, a single letter, changes the whole game. And so what actually happens in me, and I know exactly where it is on my chromosomes. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. On my 11th chromosome, on the long part of it, there's an interesting thing that happened. So there's, um, there's basically two deletions and then one insertion. And the reason that matters is, although there's four letters, when you put them all together in a chain, they're read in groups of three. Mm -hmm. So if you're subtracting two and adding one, what happens is it shifts we call it a frame shift. It shifts the groups of three in which your DNA is being read. So basically my DNA stops being read at exactly that point in that chromosome. And that's what gives me my whole problem. So um, what I would say is get back to your question, Rain. The vast majority of neuroendocrine tumors are simply bad luck. Meaning yeah. at some point when your body was copying itself and it does so literally millions of times a day. Um, and it's actually kind of a miracle that more mistakes aren't made, frankly. Um, the, the change can be advantageous to the cell that inherits the defect. That's cancer. So cancer uh, almost uniformly is a case where by random error, usually, the DNA sequence is changed and it's changed in a manner that confers some sort of advantage onto the mutant cell over the normal cell. And typically, that means that barriers with neighboring cells start to break down. So most cells, if, say, you put them in a Petri dish, if they grow and they touch another cell, they'll stop. It's called contact inhibition. It's like they recoil from, from um, being adjacent to another cell, whereas a cancer cell will not do that. A cancer cell will keep on growing. It doesn't care about its neighbors. There's actually instances in, in the lab of cancer cells popping off the top of a Petri dish just with the power of their own expansion, that's how malignant they can be. So I think what you're getting at is, it's really, really important for patients and doctors, of course, to understand the crucial distinction mm -hmm. between a sporadic error, a bad luck error that leads to a tumor versus a inherited defect. So the reason I'm so sensitive to this is that's what runs in my family. Yeah. And um, also I had my own genetic testing uh, in 2009. It turns out it was sort of uh, best of times, worst of times to get tested. So it was best of times in the sense that just the year before, the federal government passed legislation called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, just like the woman's name. And what it does is it says if you're diagnosed with a genetic disorder, uh, your employer 
cannot cannot fire you or lessen your wages. Uh, your health insurance cannot go up solely because of that diagnosis. So that was great to have that protection. Unfortunately, uh, it's not full defense. So your life insurance premiums can go up. Mm. Uh, your and this is kind of playing the longer game, but your disability insurance and your long-term care insurance, like nursing home placement, that can all rise. So the government said, okay, we're going to protect this stuff, but largely because of lobbying, they weren't allowed to protect the other uh, insurance policies. And so I kind of stumbled into all this. I had no idea about the law. I just wanted an answer clinically. Um, and so I, I would say I have partial protection and I've you know, learned to incur um, those financial penalties. I, I say it out loud though, because I want other people yeah. to understand if you run headlong into genetic testing, meaning testing of you, um, you can actually run into some pretty significant or fall into some pretty significant pitfalls. Got it. Well, we got some questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and start pivoting to, to that. Um, uh, Dwayne says, did you try Lanreotide before ultimately having your Whipple procedure? And, and I'll add on to that. If so, or if not, what, what, what was the, 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 the stage or before that, you know, what yeah, great question. That's fantastic. So the answer is no, I've actually not yet had a somatostatin analog of any type. And I know mm. you're trying to be a little bit brain neutral. So I'll say, you know, I use mm. my practice, all forms of somatostatin analog. Um, the reason, uh, Dwayne, is um, the growth rate of my tumor that prompted my surgery was fast enough that I actually was not sure that lamreotide was going to work. Mm. So what, what happened was, so I, I diagnosed myself with this syndrome right when I was starting my oncology training. So as a quick aside, it turns out that if you show up uh, in your fellowship and you're doing cancer medicine and you tell the doctor assigned to you that you think you have a tumor syndrome, the first thing they're going to assume, and perhaps not wrongly, is that you're a hypochondriac, right? We read a lot of textbooks. Uh, there's something called medical student syndrome, where you convince <laughs> yourself that everything you've learned about yeah. is medicine. <laughs> um, it doesn't maybe seem too funny outside of medicine, but one of my uh, fellow med students had a nosebleed and we all immediately went to it being Ebola. Um, so that kind of leaps of logic, but regardless, um, you know, once I got past the, you know, again, understandable skepticism and I got my diagnosis, then it was time to figure out, well, what's actually wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to do in someone with my condition, which is MEN1 or multiple endocrine neoplasia type one is almost all of us to a person have to fix our parathyroid glands. So I'm pointing to my neck underneath my tie. These are tiny little, typically pea sized glands live on the backside of the thyroid. So next to thyroid, parathyroid. And they have nothing to do with the thyroid. They're just there. They have everything to do with how your bones uh, turn over. So it's funny when you look at a skeleton, you know, in a museum or such, it looks so static. You know, our bones just look like they're doing nothing. Yeah. But when we're alive, they're constantly in motion. And yeah. it's beautiful actually, because A, they give us structure and, uh, and form. But B, they're also a reservoir of calcium. So at any given time, something like 98% of your calcium is in your bones and 2% is in your bloodstream. And it's a very tightly regulated uh, dance. And you only want that 2% in your bloodstream because if it's any more than that, your bones get weak. So when I was diagnosed, I already had osteoporosis because this, uh, this uh, leaching process had been going on unchecked for years. So my point is I fixed this first. I had three and a half of my glands taken out and just thrown away. And then my remnant gland eventually, because it's genetically programmed to do so, is going to get big again and cause problems. But so far, so good. So then I turned my attention to my pancreas. And what I found when I was 30 years old, is my entire pancreas had tumors in it. It's always going to. For as long as I have a pancreas, that's how I'm programmed. And, um, and so my point then, Dwayne, is I was following my pancreas every year. And it's funny, too. I'll say I was at, I was at Mayo, and I got a host of different surgical opinions. So one place I will empathize with the audience is you almost get a different answer uh, or a number of answers based on the number of specialists you've been to. We all kind of look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And Rain, you and I recorded a, a surgery video here pretty recently. And I think there's all different ways of looking at surgery for these Absolutely. tumors. And you know, I, I would actually argue, I think the sign of a really, really good surgeon is not just their technical aptitude, it's knowing when not to operate. Uh, I think that's really, really important, especially if like me, your body is going to be, you know, mutated for your entire life. So I got, I got literally this range of options. I got pure observation, have the Whipple procedure, which I've now had, which removes the head of the pancreas, or the most radical, have my entire pancreas removed. Just take care of the problem. Um, 
I literally had those three opinions to juggle as a 30 year old man, you know, who was getting into, but did not yet fully understand oncology. Um, So what I opted for actually was observation. I said, well, this sounds really invasive, either a Whipple or a full pancreatectomy. Um, So why don't I watch? And and funnily enough, um, in an act of supreme selfishness, uh, at Mayo, one of my jobs as a trainee was I had to do a research project. And I actually went to my faculty. I said, hey, listen, um, I know this is going to sound self-serving. I want my research project to be um, how do you predict which MEA1 patients need pancreas surgery? And they said, actually, that's a question that we don't have the answer to, so go for it. And I was so lucky. They paired me up with endocrine surgeons, and I got to go down in the archives and look up literally hundreds of cases and sort of figure out, you know, what no, what no patient has is a time machine. You don't have the ability to go back and say, okay, if I had gone path A, how would things go versus path B? But what I had, which was almost as good, was this massive historical archive, like literally some of the records I was looking at dated back into the early 1900s. So I had almost a century of information. And of course, things evolved greatly in that in that period of time. Um, so Mayo, again, could not have been nicer about it. And I ended up actually getting to go to Japan and present these findings at an endocrine conference. It was one of these pinch me moments where I was like, how did I get here? This is like, I'm so lucky to be in this position. So yeah. what I found is this, most MEN1 patients can monitor their pancreas until one of two things happen. Either one tumor becomes dominant and grows larger than three centimeters. So we love the metric system in medicine. That's a little bit over an inch, like an inch and something. Or, and or one of the tumors starts showing a much faster growth rate than all the others. And that's what happened to me is I was having yearly scans. And then one year, actually the year I moved here, uh, my dominant tumor jumped in size more than doubled and I could tell its growth rate was taking off. So all the others stayed even keel. This one bad actor started accelerating. So Dwayne, the long answer to your question is, that's why I didn't do lamreotide is I sensed, and I was ultimately proven right by the pathology, that the proliferative rate, the sort of cell turnover in that one tumor was becoming so fast that A, it needed to come out, and B, I was unlikely really to be able to hit the brakes, so to speak, with either lamreotide or sandostatin LAR. And that's exactly what happened. That's why I had my surgery. I have so far been proven right, mm-hmm. uh, both by the pathology and by the fact I've not yet developed metastases. That could change the next time I get a scan. I get scanned annually at this point, but so far so good. If I do develop metastases, probably the first thing I'll do is a drug like lamreotide. Yeah. But it's funny, I, I'm a little bit, I mean, honest with my patients, like I've not really had anything systemic. I've had two arguably major surgeries, but I've not required any of the drugs that I often prescribe. Got it. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, you know, Dr. Lewis, you had mentioned something about the different approaches from surgeons. And so Clinton, this leads well into his question. How should how should a prospective patient choose a surgeon? Are there rating services, scorecards, anything like that? Yes. Okay, great question. So actually, I'll, I'll tell you how I did it. So I'm here at Intermountain. I, I'm, I think I'm at the best uh, or one of the best surgical hospitals in the entire state or region. Um, and, and one way I know that to answer your question is volume. So as a general rule, the more complicated the procedure, um, the more you want your surgeon doing it. So um, anyone that's read uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he has this theory, you have to do something for 10,000 hours to acquire mastery. So my favorite band in the entire world is the Beatles. In fact, somewhere in my office, I have a painting of Abbey Road that my daughter uh, painted for me. That's awesome. That's my favorite album. And everyone acts like the Beatles just came out in, you know, 1962, 1963, and were <laughs> sort of just formed and, and perfect and ready to go. They got there through literally thousands of hours of practice in some very seedy clubs in Hamburg. Yeah. And by being together as a unit and being forced to practice, they became, you know, again, in my mind, the best band in the world. Um, you want your surgeon to follow the same <clears throat> path where they need to be doing something a lot to be really, really good at it. So one thing you can ask objectively, and this is not a rude question. I would say to any surgeon that you're interviewing, because you're interviewing them, not the other way around. I would say, how many of these have you done? Okay. And funnily enough, my patients will do the same thing to me. And yes, doctors are famous for quote, having egos, but actually I would say the tables are turning. And especially for this patient population, you guys are super savvy. I, without question, say that you, the neuroendocrine patients are the savviest For sure. patients in oncology because it typically takes years to get the answer you're looking for. And in the process, you become remarkably good at research and self-advocacy. So 
Back to the surgeon, not at all a rude question to say, have you done this before? Question number two, how many do you do a year? Yeah. So one very interesting data point is let's say you're having the Whipple surgery like me. You want to ask not just of that surgeon, but of that facility, how many procedures do you do here per year? Great and with the Whipple, it's actually really interesting. You know, anytime you're looking at a number, you have to kind of figure out well, where you're going to put your cut point. But with the Whipple, it comes around the number 10. So if a, if a surgeon, and certainly if a hospital, does fewer than 10 Whipples a year, the outcomes are demonstrably worse. And again, that's no knock on them. It's just you get better the more you do something. So that was a key question for me. And funnily enough, you know, I, I came from Mayo. I came from MD Anderson without flexing. I mean, I had colleagues saying, oh, you should come back. You should come back to Minnesota. You should come back to Houston. I mean, at that point, I lived in Utah. I knew recovery was going to be tough, and I didn't really want to be out of state. But I knew I had these places to go, and I was extremely fortunate to have networked there, and I had you know, surgeons I totally trusted. Mm -hmm. The reason I picked here is, A, I had every faith in my surgeon, and ultimately he proved that through and through. And, and B, um, I wanted to be closer to home for my recovery. My recovery was not linear. If I've learned anything through this as a patient, it's that you know things can look one way on paper, and they can look like it's going to be you do step A, and then you're at step B. For me, it was completely the opposite. I had a very rocky road. I was let out of the hospital after six days. I was back in after seven, and then I was in there for five weeks. Um, and so being close to home as opposed to out of state was huge for my family, um, for my support from home. And again, ultimately, I, I don't think I suffered at all. I think my surgeon was absolutely phenomenal. The complications I incurred could have happened anywhere, and I don't think were his fault. Um, basically, there's a, there's a rule on surgery I won't state it out loud because it's very profane, but the basic rule is don't mess with the pancreas. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is it's a very sensitive organ. Among other things, its texture is something like cheese. So when you cut through the pancreas, you got to realize what the surgeon's up against. They have to then sew that, that cheesy remnant to something. So either you're, if you're doing a, what's called a distal pancreatectomy and you're cutting off the back half, you're basically sewing off that end and hoping that digestive enzymes don't then spill into the belly. And if you're going the other direction, you have to then sew what's left of the tail of the pancreas to the gut. And so these are all very tenuous connections. And so that's where the complexity of the surgery and that's where the skill and practice of the surgeon come into play. Because what they're doing is throwing knots into cheese, basically, and then asking that connection to hold up, even though the pancreas itself is making some of the most caustic enzymes in the entire body. So that's why pancreas surgery is so fraught with difficulty. Got it. You know, I've had a couple of questions about genetic testing since we kind of, you know, touched on yep. that briefly. And overall, the, the question is, you know, do you recommend genetic testing for this type of cancer? Or mm -hmm. is there a certain group of patient where you would? Yeah, great question. So I will say here, I don't think this falls entirely on the patient. Okay. Uh, every patient I see, actually, it's a, you know, regardless of whether it's neuroendocrine or colon, um, ask me or is thinking, you know, is this hereditary? And you know, one of the reasons I love Utah so much, this is an extremely family friendly state. Um, my wife's a pediatrician. There are kids galore here. The average age is 30. So um, believe me, family history matters here a lot. And um, the Church of um, Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is based here, and they have remarkable genealogy. In fact, there's people flying out from all over the world to kind of do their family trees. So what I'm getting at is I talk about family history a lot. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's incumbent largely upon the oncologist to take a good family history. So that means not just accepting you know, the, the phrase I hate, Rain, and you don't tend to see this too much in oncology notes, is there is this word in medicine is called non-contributory. So someone will say, because you're supposed to take a family history and everybody Right. Uh, but either because you don't have the time or sometimes because there's urgency, like, you know, someone's having a heart attack, you're not going to mm -hmm. slow down and ask them about their grandfather. Um, sometimes it gets sort of cast aside. But I hate seeing that word when cancer is in the mix because it is seldom non-contributory. So what I'm getting at right. is sometimes it's actually the oncologist takes the history. And I'll give you an example. We have learned in the last decade that the same mutation that drives a lot of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and is actually the reason that Angelina Jolie most famously had her mastectomy, uh, that same mutation drives the non-endocrine form of some pancreas cancer. So it seems completely disconnected that your 
you know, your maternal aunt and your grandmother would have had breast or ovarian cancer, but it actually matters a tremendous amount. Hmm. So what I'm getting at is not even enough to say, oh, some relative had cancer. You really want to drill down. And this is a two-way street. You want to know as much as you can about your family, and then your oncologist ought to then take that from you. So really, you're kind of meeting in the middle. And that's where the oncologist should or should not recommend genetic counseling. I cannot stress to you enough. A, these direct-to-consumer tests like 23andMe, they're very appealing, but they are not necessarily clinically validated, and you cannot entirely trust what they tell you mm. if you're really looking for a disease-causing mutation. Secondly, a genetic counselor knows the right test to order and can help you navigate all the insurance pitfalls that I mentioned earlier. So I just went into it not really having any of that foresight or advice. I just said, I want the ME one test. Boom, I got the result. Again, I was kind of working my professional courtesy there and asking another doctor to order it for me. In hindsight, I would not have done it that way. I would have asked uh, to see genetic counseling and gone through them for all of the relevant testing. Um, so the takeaway for this talk is, again, I can't stress enough. Most people with carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors do not have hereditary syndromes. By some estimates, it's probably fewer than 20% of us are in that group. Um, however, if you really still have questions, I mean, talk to whichever doctor is managing your nets. And, um, and, and, if, and if they're uncertain, then absolutely a genetic counselor should be mm -hmm. involved. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Scott says, are there any studies or indications on what may impact cell pr proliferation rate? Is, is, is it that a single or group of sales cells with a tumor may be of a higher rate, which eventually wins among the rest, or are there potentially other factors? Yeah. So I, I get why you're asking this. So another way of looking at it is the KI-67. So the leader of the support group here in Utah is a wonderful man. His name is Merlin Densley. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that impresses about me the most, he's not, uh, he doesn't have a medical background, but he has learned a unbelievable amount about neuroendocrine tumors. I actually put him up there with some doctors I know, not, not net specialists, but, but actually pretty close. Um, so one of the things he does, which is so beautiful, is he trains the members of our group to know these sort of fingerprint details about their tumor. And, and I always know when Merlin sent me a patient because they'll show up in my office and I'll you know, say, hey, what brings you here? And they'll be like, oh, I have a grade two functional mid-gut tumor with a KI-67 of 8%. You know, it's that kind of level of granular detail, which frankly is a joy <laughs> from the, the oncologist perspective because half the consultation is already done at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can just focus on how they're feeling and how to make them feel better. However, what I think the question is getting at is, is, is one of two things. Number one, growth rate absolutely matters in how we manage these tumors. And one real downside, I think, to the carcinoid label, which I know a lot of people actually sort of don't like so much. I'm going to grab a prop here behind me. So one of the reasons I keep this on my desk, this is the father of neuroendocrine pathology. Yes. For those of you who don't know him, his name is uh, Siegfried uh, Oberndorfer. He was a pathologist in Munich in um, the early 20th century. In 1907, he was doing autopsies and found in the small intestine of some of the postmortem cases, these tiny tumors that to him did not classically look like cancer. It wasn't clear from his investigations that they'd either been bothersome during life or that they'd spread anywhere, so he called them cancer-like. The German word for that is carzenoid. And even by the end of his life, he was a uh, a Jewish man, and he actually had to flee the Third Reich and um, ultimately ended uh, dying in Istanbul in the early 1940s. He tried. He realized this was a misnomer, and he tried to fix it. And it was too late. Even now, you know, what, 100 and something years later, it's entrenched. And it's, you know, part of the name of your organization. I'm not saying that's wrong. But my, my point is, is that even physicians will sometimes use the carcinoid label um, to infer incorrectly that these tumors are not harmful or aggressive. And so what I'm getting at is growth rate is typically measured as a percentage. So there's various ways of doing it. You can either count with a microscope how many cells are dividing, which is pretty rigorous work. You're looking for what's called mitoses or the, the moment where they're uh, copying and then splitting. Or, and this is the probably more efficient way of doing it, you can lay down a chemical that brings out those signals and you can measure how many stain positive versus how many stain negative. Now, if you take a really aggressive 
tumor, a neuroendocrine carcinoma, and you stain it, that number can be, gosh, upwards of you know, 55, 80%. Um, those are people that frankly need chemotherapy, okay? And, and using the word carcinoid as some sort of dismissive term in terms of prognosis is absolutely the wrong thing to do. And you'll find many people, uh, even in groups like this one, who have been told, oh, you don't have cancer, you have carcinoid. And in fact, the growth rate is through the roof and it's just yeah. as aggressive as some of the other things I treat. Yeah. On the flip side, some of these growth rates are among the slowest and the most indolent you'll encounter in oncology period. So if you do this growth rate and you get back like 1%, sometimes zero, that's a tumor that's essentially hibernating the majority of the time and giving chemo is frankly malpractice. So back to your question specifically. Number one, for the most part, growth rates tend to stay relatively stable. And you tend to know if the growth rate is changing because like me, either you see a tumor all of a sudden act out of character, meaning get much bigger than you would expect over a given period of time. Um, or if you're doing say functional imaging. So a lot of our patients these days will get you know, special PET scans, right? Mm -hmm. Which are looking for receptors on the surface of the tumors. If those receptors were there and now are gone, that's a bad sign. That typically signifies a tumor that's getting a lot faster and going through a process called de-differentiation, whereby it no longer even has the receptors. And that's almost always an aggressive actor. And then finally, the part of the question I want to get at is sampling. So unless you're dealing with a tumor that you have cut out in block, you have the whole thing in front of you, you're only ever taking a piece of a tumor. And I think what the question is really getting at is how much can you trust that you're not dealing with sampling bias? And the answer is, you know, you don't know. Yeah. For sure. Um, there, you really do have to think clinically. You have to think about, well, does, does this number I'm getting back, does this make sense with what I'm feeling as the patient or what my doctor is seeing in me? If you've got a patient whose disease appears to be absolutely explosive in its growth rate, and you do a biopsy and you get back 2%, well, that just doesn't add up. So there, there is this notion, and it's very tricky to wrap your head around, it's called intra or intertumoral heterogeneity. So let's break that down. Yeah. In or between tumor difference. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that's for sure in oncology is you can get different answers depending on what you biopsy. In my practice, if I'm dealing with liver metastasis, even if there's still a tumor somewhere else like the pancreas or the gut, I actually will biopsy the liver nine times out of 10 because A, the liver is a lot more accessible it's generally pretty easy to get to with an ultrasound. And B, I'm actually more interested, frankly, in what the metastasis is doing than I am in the primary tumor. Because the metastasis and its behavior is generally more influential on how that patient is going to do in the long run. And I, I craft my treatments accordingly. I have in my head sort of one path I go down if the growth rate is 10% or lower, another path between 10 and 20, another path between 20 and 55, and another path 55 and up. And none of those numbers are arbitrary, but I won't waste your time explaining how I came up with the cutoffs. Most neuroendocrine specialists think very similarly, mm -hmm. and most of us feel like you're flying blind unless you know the growth rate. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks, Scott, for your question. Next question, Linda says, uh, Dr. Lewis, how are, how are you monitored yearly? What test, what imaging? Yeah, thank you for asking. So one of the things to think about, and I'm not trying to scare anyone about past or future tests, mm -hmm. is radiation. For sure. So, when I was coming out of fellowship, I actually had a couple of faculty who were what I call um, sentries. They, they thought that their uh, job was sort of to be security guards for their patients, and they thought their main duty was monitoring. So I had one faculty member, a, a man I, I still greatly respect, but whose practice I have not adopted. And he said, Mark, when you're following people, and this is true, he said, you want to be getting a CT scan every three months. <clears throat> so that's great, um, but you know CTs are stacks of X-rays. So commuted, excuse me, com computed tomography means that you're taking typically something like 200 X-rays that are taken in, in thin slices, and then you're using a computer to re reconstruct them, and you're 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 simulating three dimensions of two-dimensional slices. <clears throat> but my point is that's a lot of radiation. So if you do, if you follow that guy's advice. And if I was to do a CT scan, say on Urain, you know, three every three months for five years, it's four times a year times five, that's 20 scans times 200, that's 4,000 x-rays. That is, by some math, enough to cause 
a cancer, especially if you've already had one. So we don't do that, or I don't do that. Um, So I'm down to two options at this point. So I used to, every year, to the, the question, I used to get ultrasound put down my throat and put next to my pancreas, and that allowed, A, no radiation involved, B, to be right there if sampling was necessary, if they needed to biopsy something. So that was very, very appealing. Uh, yes, it was slightly invasive, it required sedation, it required me taking a day off, but you know, I was able to do it, I had experts to do it, and I knew I was incurring no radiation in the process. So now that I've had my surgery though, the upper gut in me is completely rearranged. So the head of my pancreas is gone, and where the intestine used to kind of curve around it, that's also been cut out, and I've been all kind of put back together. I, my joke about the Whipple is, you know, they do to the upper abdomen what Picasso did to faces. Mm. You take the parts you can recognize and you shift them and you can kind of end up seeing, you know, the original expression, but yeah. cubist interpretation of it. So my <laughs> point is the ultrasound won't work anymore because they just can't get that ultrasound where it needs to be. Yeah. So I'm down to one of two options and I'll tell you which one I, I defer to. Right now, I am lucky enough to do an MRI every year. And the reason I picked that is an MRI is a big magnet. I know it's noisy. I know it's tight in the machine. Uh, but uh, in 45 minutes, I get all the pictures I need for the year. I incur no radiation and I get extremely good pictures of my liver and my pancreas. The one thing it is not good at looking at, and this is important for a carcinoid population, is the gut. Because in the 45 minutes you're in the machine, uh, your gut's going to move all over the place. There's no way, I mean, no matter how still you are, you can hold your breath for 45 minutes, although I don't recommend it, uh, your gut's going to be moving uh, constantly uh, mm-hmm. through, you know, it's like if we were see-through, it's almost like a big bag of snakes. So that doesn't work very well for the gut. So then my backup and the go-to for many people is going to be a PET scan. Um, and again, if you really read the fine print, most PET scans are actually PET slash CT. So you're putting some sort of isotope into the arm. And then you're seeing where it goes, and then you're mapping that against the CT. Now, here at my institution, this is not the case everywhere, that CT is extremely low dose in terms of radiation. You just want sort of the the minimum possible anatomic detail, so you have some framework over which you can superimpose the isotope map. You don't need the CT to be as strong as uh, incurring as much radiation as a normal CT would. So my point is, as you add up your lifetime radiation exposure, um, you know, regular CT scans, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a sum uh, every time you're adding to the sum every time you get a CT. MRI is zero. And then somewhere in the middle usually is the contribution from PET scans. Got it. Thanks for that. Thanks for your question. A uh, few more minutes left with our guest, Dr. Mark Lewis today, folks. And if you joined us late, we have to end today's episode shortly. But three three quick reminders. One, when he leaves, I have a special gift for you that I will uh, uh, that I will give you. <laughs> Two, uh, because today is short, we couldn't get to all the questions. We rarely do, in fact, because there's a lot of questions. So if you have follow-up questions, reach out to Carsonoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. And third, if you want to revisit the video, it will live here on the Facebook page. Uh, it'll be evergreen. You can go to the videos tab and access it, rewatch it. And also starting Monday, we republish it to YouTube. So anyone who doesn't have Facebook can access it as well. Uh, Margaret says, and, and I've, I've heard this question before, can low grade net tumors change to high grade aggressive tumors? And if so, what's the likelihood of something like that happening? So thankfully the likelihood is relatively low, okay. but yes, it's entirely possible. <clears throat> so I have over my shoulder a zebra that will resonate with many of you and um, was painted for me by my daughter <clears throat> who truly does not get her artistic talent from me. She's a far better artist than I'll ever be. She's only 13, but she made me the zebra. My point is I tell my patients sometimes the zebra can lose its stripes. So this is actually very well documented in other types of cancer. So very famously in lymphoma, there are very indolent forms of lymphoma called low grade lymphomas that sometimes don't even require treatment and you can just watch them. And then all of a sudden, they become high grade. So they go from being observed to now all of a sudden requiring chemo. And that low to high grade switch is called Richter's transformation. So that's an eponym named after the doctor that described it. Thankfully, it does not happen very often in neuroendocrine tumors. And if I had to put a percentage on it, I would put it at under 10%. Uh, Now, if you're in that under the 10%, of course, it's going to matter to you. And again, it's usually not a clinically silent event. So one thing I do not want this audience to take away is, oh my gosh, 
are all my tumors going to flip tomorrow? More than likely not. And if things were to change, there would be signs for you and or your doctor. So let's talk about what aggressive means. So I actually literally just came from a consult and I'm going to go to a consult where I was being asked the question, doctor, is my cancer aggressive? And that's a very subjective term. The way I'll often flip it around is to say, is the cancer fast growing? Because as a general rule, the faster something goes, the more threatening it is if left unchecked, but mm -hmm. the more responsive it is to chemo. Because a fast growing cell is one that is vulnerable to chemotherapy. On the flip side, if you give most neuroendocrine tumors, if you expose them to chemo, and let's say they're sitting there at a 1% growth rate, that means again, 99% of the cells are dormant and chemo is just not gonna work. So it's generally very obvious to the patient, the doctor, or both, that a cancer cell, and specifically a, a neuroendocrine cell, is changing its stripes to become low to high grade. So like I said earlier, either you lose a receptor signal on a PET scan, the patient themselves will actually sense the change. And, and, and the one big thing I, I educate all of my patients on is weight. Weight is the fifth or sixth vital sign in oncology. Weight is so important because, again, for all the fad diets and everything out there, all weight loss equals calories out are exceeding calories in. So if you've kept everything else the same, you're not on a crash diet, you're not you know, on an exercise kick that's new. I just joined Peloton the last month and I am losing weight. Um, <laughs> then there's some explanation for why you're losing weight and you need to know why. And, yeah. and a, a fast growing cancer is consuming calories from you and everything else left to its own devices, you will lose weight. And so I tell patients, and I certainly pay attention when they, they weigh in, yeah. that, that weight is really important to monitor. To that point, uh, Mary Helen has a, a question about uh, holistic med you know, treatment. Uh, would taking a holistic medicine treatment like ASEA to remove minerals from your body be beneficial? This was recommended to me by a cardiologist to treat carcinoid syndrome. Hmm. Uh, what do you think about holistic med uh, medication or treatment? Well, and I realize this may be the last question I get to answer, Rand, so I'll try okay. to be succinct, but also get okay. to it. So um, listen, I, I try to be extremely open-minded uh, with my patients and be very honest about some things. I was trained in what's called allopathic medicine. Some other definitions call that Western medicine. So the way that we're taught here is largely through very, very rigorous uh, and large clinical trials. They establish this evidence base, and then we go off of that. And here's my point. There are so many supplements on the market that you can get, but the question is, should you be taking them and or how much faith can you have in them? Very few of them are regulated by the FDA. Mm. Uh, the one that actually comes to mind is prenatal vitamins. We understandably put more um, need for authenticity on those than almost anything else that you can buy off the shelf. And then I guess I'll get to the point about this particular supplement in a second, but I'll say that if you're doing a study of a supplement especially one that might interact with nutrition, just think for a second about how many people you would need to study to actually have a strong signal. So we have this thing in statistics called power, which basically means how big a number do you need before you can trust the result? And the answer in these studies is you need thousands of people and you generally need one group to very rigorously adhere to one thing and then the other group to adhere, adhere to whatever your intervention is. And that is profoundly difficult to do whether it's diet, supplements, or both. So most of these studies, unfortunately, are drastically undercut by the fact they just don't have the statistical uh, underpinning. And lastly, in regard to carcinoid syndrome, uh, and again, I know this is sponsored by Tercera, but this is not an ad for them. Um, a drug like uh, Teletristat or Zermelo mm -hmm. is really interesting. It's a first-in-class agent. And again, this is not you know me being a show for them. But it is a, a, a drug unlike anything else in neuroendocrine tumors, because what it's actually doing is going at a nuclear level to the center of the neuroendocrine tumor cells and preventing the cells from making serotonin in the first place. So everything else that you're doing, whether it's a supplement or a change in diet, um, is frankly going to be less effective, I think, than going to the heart of the matter and preventing those cells from making serotonin. Um, and so I guess I would just end with that. I, I'm not particularly familiar with nor a fan of um, ASEA or frankly any supplement. Um, I always recommend that patients ask their doctor if they're having refractory carcinoid syndrome, ask them what other options are there. And so remember the shots that we give, whether it's tenostatin or lamreotide or short-acting octreotide, those are operating on the surface at a receptor level. 
What a drug like uh, teletristat does is operate at that nuclear level. And I think that's really the most effective approach against syndrome. Awesome. Uh, is that your cutoff point? Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis. I appreciate you. Everybody else stick around. I'm going to give you something of value. Dr. Lewis, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. I hope you have a great rest of the talk and thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye now. Okay, so everybody, um, very recently we re released a video featuring Dr. Lewis, and this video is on surgery for neuro neuroendocrine tumors, and it also features Dr. Alexandra Ganji, Dr. Rodney Pommier, who are both surgeons, and Dr. Lewis, who is an oncologist, not a surgeon, but included him because of his unique, unique perspective as a net patient. So it's a very, very uh, uh, informative video, but also very easy to understand. You can tell Dr. Lewis has a great way of, of explaining things so they're, that they're easy to grasp. grasp. So I'm going to add that uh, to the comments uh, right now. And if you can't access it there, if you don't see it in the comments, it's pinned to the top of our page, or you can go to the videos tab. But since most of you allocate this time and have about 15 more minutes set aside, I thought that was a good opportunity to continue extending the value to you. This is an awesome video. It's the last of a series of 10, I think that we did last year, uh, treatment based videos, you can see it at the videos tab, but I'm going to add it to the comments uh, right now. Surgery. for nets. I'll say you all know what nets are. Uh, so I'll copy that into the comments. And that's what I think that you all should do is, is take some time out to watch it. If you can't now, of course, that's understandable. Um, but if that speaks to you, if that's something you're interested in, I would refer back to it. The link is there. It's also pinned to the, uh, the top of our Facebook page. So you can easily ex access it there. Uh, I think you get a lot of value from it. But thank you so much, as always, uh, for attending. I love this community. I love this group. We had excellent numbers today. Dr. Lewis is, is great. Understandably, we couldn't get to all the questions. So again, I'll reiterate, reach out to Carson and Cancer Foundation to, to follow up with any questions and they'll give you the direction you need here on their Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. And you can always revisit this video as well, which will live on the videos tab. Thanks again to, to Tercera Therape Therapeutics, our sponsor. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Thank you for watching. Please join us next time for Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. And if I close out before you see that uh, link to the video, again, it's pinned to the top of our Facebook page. Have a great day, everybody.